We're pleased to welcome Jeff Sue from Orbi Med for today's Biotech Growth Trust update. After a sustained growth to value rotation and risk off environment that has favoured large cap over small cap stocks, it's timely to hear from Jeff about the long term key strategic positioning in the trust. There have been historically large and long drawdowns in small cap biotech stocks, which have impacted returns in the trust, despite being an otherwise healthy fundamental sector. Or we may continue to believe that in the biotech space, you should invest in the most innovative companies with technologies that will further the standard of care in their chosen specialist area. It is this belief that has led them to be overweight, the benchmark, in small cap biotech companies. With that, I'll hand over to Jeff. Thank you so much, Matt. And thank you to everyone for joining this investor webinar and giving me the opportunity to update you on the Biotech Growth Trust. So just a quick update on Orbimed. We are a global healthcare dedicated investment manager. We manage about $17 billion of assets right now across multiple business lines. And you can see from the slide that the Biotech Growth Trust and its sister trust, the Worldwide Healthcare Trust, comprise a large part of our public equity business. We are continually expanding our footprint and now have 134 employees worldwide. Uh, the next page here shows the specific members of our investment team that work on the Biotech Growth Trust. I have been the portfolio manager of the trust since 2005, and I do work closely with six biotech analysts, most of whom have an educational degree in the sciences, uh, looking at various areas of the space. We also have an analyst covering specialty pharmaceuticals, as well as an analyst covering life science tools and diagnostics. And the four individuals at the bottom of this page are actually professionals that we have in our Shanghai and Hong Kong offices, and they cover Chinese biotech for us. So just to update uh, you on the fiscal year to date performance, this covers the period from March 31st, 2022 to January 31st, 2023. You can see over the span of time, the Biotech Growth Trust NAV is up 10.3% versus the NASDAQ Biotech Index uh, benchmark, uh, which is up 11.6% over this time frame. If one takes a look uh, at a longer term graph, just looking at the Biotech Growth Trust performance since our inception as managers in May of 2005, you can see that since inception, we have outperformed the benchmark index, the NASDAQ Biotech Index. But as you can see from this graph, we did have a significant performance drawdown in 2021 and 2022 that we are in the midst of recovering from. And we're hopeful that we'll be able to recover a lot of that lost outperformance over the next several months. So let me uh, just explain exactly what happened uh, starting in 2021. Basically, we saw a major performance divergence between large and small cap biotech. If one looks at the lower left-hand corner of this slide at this table, what we've done is taken the uh, portfolio holdings of the Biotech Growth Trust as of March 31st, 2021, so the beginning of the prior fiscal year, and categorized those holdings uh, across three market cap categories, large cap stocks above $10 billion, mid cap stocks between two and $10 billion, and small cap stocks below $2 billion. And if you compare that distribution uh, versus the benchmark index, the NASDAQ Biotech Index, you can see that at that time, March 31st, 2021, we were basically significantly underweight large cap stocks and significantly overweight small cap stocks versus the index. Now, unfortunately, if one looks at the average stock returns in each of those market cap categories for the index constituents, you can see on this graph that since March 31st, 2021, all the way through the end of January 2023, that small cap biotech and mid cap biotech have significant, significantly underperformed large cap biotech. And so the differential in performance between small cap and large cap is on the order of 40%. And clearly the way that we are positioned in the portfolio of being underweight large caps and significantly overweight small caps, uh, that really uh, led to a significant headwind to relative performance versus the index. Now, having said that, we are uh, confident that small caps right now are extremely oversold. We do think that performance gap is going to close and small cap and mid caps will recover performance and catch up to their large cap peers. And that is why if you look on the upper right hand corner of the slide uh, at the table that shows a snapshot of how we are positioned as of January 31st, 
2023, you can still see uh, that we are largely positioned as underweight large cap and overweight small cap because we think there is a compelling recovery trade in small caps that we want to capture uh, going forward. So why do we believe in that small cap recovery? Well, uh, first, here is a graph showing the XBI versus the S&P 500 um, since 2006. The XBI is actually an equal weighted biotech index that many people use as a proxy to look at small and mid cap biotech performance. It was created in 2006. And this is a graph showing the relative performance of the XBI versus the S&P 500 over the past 15 years or so. And you can see that in general, over the past 15 years, the XBI has outperformed the S&P 500. Uh, there are some temporary periods though of relative underperformance where the XBI underperforms the S&P 500 and that is shown by the red circles on this graph. After each of these periods of underperformance though, uh, generally speaking, the XBI outperforms the S&P 500 again, and that is shown by these green arrows. And you can see that what's so telling about this most recent drawdown on the very right-hand side is really how unusual it is. It is the longest drawdown we have ever seen of the XBI versus the S&P 500. It is the largest absolute drawdown we have seen in the XBI, and the largest and most severe relative drawdown we have seen of the XBI versus the S&P 500. Now, fortunately, it does look like the drawdown has ended. And so you can see on the very right-hand side of this slide, we are now in the recovery phase. And hopefully, if history repeats itself, we should see the XBI from here on out start outperforming the S&P 500 and hopefully reclaim the outperformance highs uh, of 2020. Another reason we're so bullish on small cap biotech, if you look at absolute valuations for the sector, uh, one way to look at that for these companies that don't generate earnings right now is simply to take a very basic measure and compare their market caps with the net cash uh, on the balance sheet for these companies. And if you plot the median ratio of market cap to net cash on the balance sheet, this is the graph that you see since 2001. Now, we like this particular metric because it's very objective. It doesn't depend on my personal views on the probability of success of drugs in the pipeline. It doesn't depend on my personal revenue projections for those assets. It's just simply looking at the market caps of these companies versus the net cash uh, on their balance sheets. And by this very sort of objective measure, you can see that this current drawdown has really driven valuations to 20-year lows. You're really uh, seeing here unprecedented uh, valuations for the sector. We're at levels now that are below the dot-com bust, below the great financial crisis, below the Hillary Clinton drug pricing tweet, and below the COVID-19 pandemic lows. And we really think that this valuation contraction is really unwarranted. Another way to look at that is just to look at the percent of biotech companies that are trading below the net cash on the balance sheet. And that's what, uh, what we've done on the left-hand side of this slide. If you look at that red circle, uh, astoundingly, about 25% of the biotech universe is now trading at market caps below the net cash on the balance sheet. And in historical context, you can see that this is a highly unusual and anomalous situation. This is well above anything we have ever seen in the past 20 years. And what that translates into on the right-hand side is over 120 biotech companies now trading at market caps below the net cash on the balance sheet. We don't think that's a sustainable uh, uh, situation. We do think it's going to go back to historical norms and that's why we're so bullish on the small cap space in particular. Now, uh, of course, uh, uh, one has to ask the question, well, why has small cap biotech underperformed so much? And I would note that what we saw in terms of the drawdown in small cap biotech is actually something we've seen across all industries in unprofitable tech. So if you look at a lot of the information technology companies, they also saw a similar drawdown in the past couple of years. And the reasons most people cite for the drawdown is, of course, the recent rise in interest rates. So inflation is high in the United States. The Fed has taken a very aggressive stance to raise interest rates uh, recently to combat that inflation. And so here is a graph showing the 10-year U.S. government yield since 2005. And sure enough, over the past a couple of years, you can see uh, a very uh, not notable rise in interest rates as the Fed uh, attempts to combat inflation. Now, we do think that the 10-year rate is going to stabilize between 3.5% and 
it's important to note that that 10-year rate already assumes continued rate hikes by the Fed into late 2023, followed by rate cuts. So we would argue that the Fed's hawkish views are already substantially incorporated into expectations in that 10-year rate, and we are not expecting much more incremental headwind from a rise in 10-year rates uh, uh, for the sector. I would also note that year-over-year -year inflation has been declining in the United States since mid-2022. So what the Fed has done has been effective in reducing inflation, and we think it's just a matter of time uh, before inflation is brought under control and those rates can then come back, to, uh, back down. So we think this is a very temporary situation. We do think interest rates will come back down at some point, and of course that's going to be a tailwind uh, for the biotech sector. Now, one of the investor fears as the Fed has been increasing interest rates is whether or not those interest rate increases are going to lead to a recession in the United States. And so we thought it would be instructive to look at how biotech in particular has performed uh, during recessionary environments. Here is data actually from Goldman Sachs, where they looked at median excess return of healthcare versus the S&P 500 during the last four recessions. And in the middle there, it shows the S&P 500 healthcare index. These are just the healthcare constituents of the S&P 500 shown here in blue. And you can see that on average, the S&P 500 healthcare index actually outperforms the S&P 500 by about 10 percentage points during a recession. And that's, um, of course, not surprising because healthcare is a defensive sector, less economically sensitive, and so it should outperform. But what's most interesting about this uh, phenomenon is that if you look at the subsectors of healthcare, uh, interestingly, the subsector that performs the best during the recession uh, is actually biotech. So on the left-hand side here, large cap biotech, followed by the XBI small and mid cap biotech actually outperforms the most versus the general markets uh, during a recession. So we don't know for certain whether or not a recession will actually materialize in the United States. Uh, but if a recession does occur, uh, it is comforting to know that biotech is actually a great place to be if you want to outperform the general markets during a recession. Uh, one quick note about China. So the Biotech Growth Trust does have a mandate to invest in biotech innovation worldwide. And so we have about 10 to 15 percent of our portfolio invested in China because we are seeing the rise of biotech innovation in that country. Uh, now, in 2021, unfortunately, again, due to completely macro uh, 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 effects, uh, we did see a broad drawdown in the China stock market generally due to the government's zero COVID policy that really dampened economic growth. And that really drove down the Hong Kong healthcare index shown on this uh, graph to seven-year lows. Uh, now, fortunately, the Chinese government has now reopened the re economy. And so we are seeing the nascent stages of a recovery in Chinese healthcare, and that should, of course, benefit our Chinese positions. So the main point uh, that I'd like to emphasize here in this presentation is that the biotech share price decline that we've witnessed over the past couple of years are really disconnected from industry fundamentals, which we believe are still very strong and we're going to show that uh, in the next few slides. So innovation is really the heart of value creation for the biotech sector. And we firmly believe that we are still in a golden era of innovation for the biopharmaceutical industry. And that is reflected in the pipeline, which uh, is shown in this graph here, which plots the number of pipeline products for the entire biopharmaceutical industry since 2011. And you can see that the pipeline continues to grow over time. In just the last five years, we have an amazing 68% increase in the number of drug candidates in the pipeline for the industry. And this is happening across all therapeutic areas. Now, what is driving that is the advent of a number of novel next generation drug development technologies, which is shown here on this graph, RNA therapeutics, cell therapy, gene editing, and gene therapy. You can see in this graph that the pipeline products derived from each of these new technologies has been increasing quite markedly in just the past five years, and that is driving a lot of the broader pipeline expansion for the industry. We still believe 
that the emerging technologies are really still in the very early stages of reaching their full potential. There are hundreds of clinical candidates now working their way through clinical trials right now. And we do expect dozens more of these next generation products to ultimately reach the market over the next several years. And that's shown in this slide. So we've just talked about how the pipeline is as full as it's ever been. And that is translating into more and more novel drugs reaching the marketplace. Here is a graph showing global launches of novel active substances since 2012. And you can see that 2021 was a record year of new drug launches worldwide, 84 new drugs uh, launched across the globe, across multiple therapeutic areas. So a very, very healthy state of innovation right now. And when those biotech drugs do launch, uh, they do have uh, the potential of generating significant revenue for the companies involved. So here is a slide showing a selected number of recent biotech drug launches. And what we've done in each of these boxes is shown the consensus broker peak sales estimates for each of these drugs. And you'll note that if you look at each of these drugs, you'll see that every single one of the drugs on this page is expected to generate peak sales in excess of a billion dollars in sales. And that is the classic threshold uh, that most people uh, uh, define as a blockbuster drug, uh, a drug capable of generating in excess of a billion dollars in sales. Some of the drugs on this slide actually we would consider mega blockbusters, um, but uh, regardless, uh, it does just go to show that this innovation uh, is not only uh, delivering important clinical benefits for patients, but also uh, brings some financial, uh, significant financial upside uh, for the companies involved. Now, you'll notice that uh, for some of these drugs, we have listed two companies uh, involved in the drug, and that is because a lot of these biotech innovators actually get taken out by a larger player uh, when the drug is sufficiently de-risked or has launched, uh, and that is the standard life cycle for a biotech company. After they have uh, successfully developed a drug, they usually don't stay as an independent entity for very long. They're usually acquired by a larger player. I did want to highlight uh, where innovation is coming from uh, in the sector, and it's mostly coming from the emerging biotech segment of the biotech universe. If one looks at the graph on the left-hand side of this page, at the share of industry R&D pipeline by company type, you can see here the light blue shaded portion uh, of this graph indicates the contributions from emerging biotech. And you can see that the share of the total industry R&D pipeline from emerging biotech has been steadily increasing over time. So that this segment is now responsible for nearly two thirds of the drug industry's total R&D pipeline. If you look on the right at the source of origination for novel active substances launched since 2012, Again, focusing on the light blue portions of each of these bars, you can see that last year in 2021, of the new drugs launched, over 50% of them were actually originated by emerging biotech. And that is exactly why this portfolio, the Biotech Growth Trust, does uh, bias itself or have a, 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 an overweight in the emerging biotech segment of the industry. That is where most of the innovation is coming from, and we want to have a uh, uh, a nice reflection of that innovation in the portfolio. So as an investor in the Biotech Growth Trust, one does get exposure to a wide swath of these novel drug development technologies. Uh, we've shown here a snapshot of the percent NAV exposure to a variety of these novel technologies as of the end of December. Uh, and I think it does give a nice cross-section to an investor uh, uh, of the innovation that's occurring across the biotech space uh, 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 um, across the biotech space. So really a good exposure across all the different technologies. And here on the page 20 are six specific examples of innovation coming to fruition. So these are six positive regulatory and clinical catalysts that occurred just in the second half of 2022. There was actually a lot of skepticism in advance of each of these catalysts about whether or not they would be positive. Uh, but in this case, all of them were. Uh, and uh, I would just emphasize that these are really uh, novel groundbreaking developments. So new phase three results uh, for an Alzheimer's drug from ASI and Biogen. Uh, another example is a phase two results for a novel mRNA based cancer vaccine in melanoma. So really striking uh, clinical results that we're seeing in the industry right now. And importantly, 
these positive catalysts were associated with significant share price appreciation for the companies involved. So as an investor, you are rewarded for taking the risk holding uh, into these positive catalysts. So I'm frequently asked which areas of biotech I'm most excited about right now. And I guess I would highlight three particular areas for 2023 as ones to focus on, gene therapy, oncology, and kidney disease. Here is a slide showing a number of companies in each of those areas. We actually own all of these companies in the Biotech Growth Trust right now. And you can see on the right-hand side, they all have some sort of catalyst, either clinical or regulatory, uh, that we think is going to uh, provide a positive inflection uh, for the valuation of these stocks. Um, for example, uh, gene therapy at the very top of this page, Unicure and Biomarin are in the midst of launching or will be expected to launch uh, their gene therapies for hemophilia this year. These products can lower the annual bleeding rates in hemophilia patients by 50 to 80% with a single injection. Uh, so that's a, a, a key focus area for gene therapy this year, but a lot of other innovative, interesting, exciting stuff going on on tap for 2023. So another uh, uh, trend I'd like to highlight right now is actually uh, M&A. Uh, M&A has been a historical driver of returns in the biotech space. And we do expect M&A activity to accelerate over the coming months because of the low valuations that we're seeing right now in emerging biotech. We think a lot of the larger players are going to take advantage uh, and acquire good assets at compelling valuations. In 2022, you can see on the left-hand side of this slide, we've seen many uh, transactions get consummated at very healthy premiums. On the right-hand side in 2023, year to date, we've already seen four transactions get announced, again, at very healthy premiums. And the red stars uh, uh, on this slide denote transactions where the Biotech Growth Trust actually held the target uh, at the time of the acquisition announcement. So we do directly benefit in the portfolio from some of this M&A activity. And there are a number of other portfolio positions that we think would make great M&A candidates for larger players. Hopefully some of those uh, will get taken out as well uh, during the balance of this year. Uh, but another reason aside from valuation why we think M&A is going to accelerate is because big pharma is going to be facing a significant patent cliff for a number of their key products in the second half of this decade. If you look at the graph on the left-hand side of this slide, it shows U.S. branded sales at risk due to loss of exclusivity of major biopharma drugs over the next several years. So tens of billions of dollars of sales from major blockbusters expected to face either generic or biosimilar competition by the end of this decade. And we've listed a few of those blockbusters on the right-hand side of this page. Humira, the best-selling drug in the world, uh, just lost exclusivity uh, this year. That was a $20 billion product for AbV. That is a major revenue hole that they are going to seek to replace. Merck uh, has their, has their uh, immunotherapy blockbuster, Keytruda. Uh, again, it's going to lose exclusivity in 2028. So what that means is that these big pharma CEOs are going to be urgently looking to acquire biotech companies with late stage products to fill that upcoming revenue gap. Lastly, let me touch on the political environment. Uh, drug pricing has been uh, an overhang. The specter of drug pricing reform has been an overhang on the uh, biotech uh, sector for several years now. Uh, and finally, actually, uh, in August of 2022, we did finally get drug, drug pricing legislation passed in the United States as part of Democrats' Inflation Reduction Act. This law does call for Medicare price negotiation starting in 2026 for a limited number of drugs that have no biosimilar or generic competition by 13 years post-approval for biologics and by nine years post-approval for small molecules. We think there's going to be no near-term pressure on the industry from this. But we do think over the long term, it may incentivize biotech companies to pursue biologics rather than small molecules. Importantly, we think passage of this legislation does clear an overhang for the sector. Now that major drug pricing legislation has passed, we don't think Congress is going to revisit this issue for the next several years, especially because Republicans did win a majority uh, in the House in November, that makes it even less likely in our view that additional drug pricing legislation is going to come up in the next several years. And so we think the clearance of this overhang really should allow the sector to re-rate upwards. 
So here on slide uh, 25 is a snapshot of the portfolio as of the end of January. There are 61 positions on this page. You can see that geographically, most of the portfolio, 87% as of the end of January, is invested in the United States. That is because most of the innovation in biotech is still occurring in the United States. But we do have some exposure to Europe uh, and China on the right-hand side uh, of the slide. So just to sum up, what is our 2023 strategy and outlook? Well, we're going to continue to emphasize emerging biotech over large cap biotech. We think that is where uh, the most uh, dislocation has occurred. Uh, we do want to capture, fully capture the sector rebound when it happens. And we think small cap biotech is the place to be uh, to do that. We will capitalize on compelling investment opportunities in companies that need to finance at low share prices. Uh, and the gearing level that you should expect uh, should stay between 5 and 10%. Uh, now, as I've emphasized, we really are seeing unprecedented low valuations in emerging biotech that does suggest significant upside from current levels. The performance drawdown we've seen in small and mid-cap biotech versus the S&P 500 was the longest and most severe in over 15 years. If you look at the percent of biotech companies with market caps below the net cash on their balance sheets, it's still well above historical norms. Valuation levels are now lower than that of the great financial crisis and the bursting of the dot-com bubble. Interest rate headwinds, importantly, we expect to abate uh, over time. And even if a recession does occur in the United States, biotech has historically outperformed uh, during recessions. So uh, importantly, again, the valuation contraction that we have seen is really significantly disconnected from the fundamental innovation that we're seeing in the sector right now which remains robust. We do expect M&A activity to accelerate given the lower valuations of the biotech targets and the urgency on the part of big pharma to address their patent cliff in the second half of the decade. We think the passage of the drug pricing legislation recently in 2022 does clear the political overhang. And lastly, we expect our China position to rebound with the country's reopening. So overall, uh, I think a very constructive outlook uh, for the sector uh, going forward. And I really do believe that this is an opportune time to enter the sector for long-term investors who want to get exposure to this very exciting and innovative space. You can get in right now at 20-year valuation lows when innovation is still very strong uh, uh, in the space. So great time to get involved in the sector uh, for the long term. And with that, thank you so much for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Jeff, thank you so much for your presentation. We just had one on China. Do you see Chinese government interve intervention as a potential risk to the pipeline or M&A activity moving forwards? And how are you managing that risk? And also combined with that, how do you see the China exposure developing in the short and long term? Sure. So one of the reasons we're so bullish about Chinese biotech is actually because in 2015, the Chinese central government made it a priority to develop a domestic biotech industry in China. And I always say that the cardinal rule for investing in China is to always invest in alignment with what the Chinese central government wants to do. So in fact, we have extensive government support for growing a domestic biotech industry in China. They're going to do uh, uh, whatever they can to, to make sure that continues. And so we have a tailwind, uh, if you will, of government policy that is going to encourage the further development of that industry in China. I think what we've seen with the COVID uh, uh, pandemic uh, only accelerates, in our view, uh, that trend. Thanks, Jeff. Um, we've got a question. Uh, who is going to pay for all these innovative drugs? Will it be the government uh, or somebody else? I suppose combined with that, how have the interest rate rises affected the biotech sector future funding situation? Sure. So who's going to pay for these drugs? Well, interestingly, if I could go back to the uh, patent cliff slide, uh, you know, I noticed, I noted that, um, let's see, where is that? Here it is. Uh, I noted that a lot of these blockbuster drugs, so this $20 billion, for example, that's now being spent on Humira, well, that is going to erode over time as biosimilars enter the marketplace. So, intrinsically in this industry, because of these patent expirations, because of the loss of exclusivity of a lot of these blockbusters, there are natural savings that society is able to garner as these company, as these products uh, go off patent. And those savings can then be deployed to pay for 
the new innovative treatments that are just uh, launching now. Um, so um, I think uh, our view is that uh, products that really deliver a significant clinical benefit for patients will always be able to command premium pricing and society, if, uh, uh, if the drug really has value, is going to find a way to pay for those particular drugs. So we're not really worried about um, the ability of society to pay for these drugs over time. Thank you. Um, there's a question about the size of the trust within Orbimed's overall stable. Um, can you reassure investors that the trust is fully resourced and attracts sufficient attention as one of the only two listed trusts in an otherwise largely private equity portfolio? But also on that front, are there any actual mutual beneficial elements to that combination? So as I outlined in the beginning of the slide presentation, uh, the Biotech Growth Trust does represent a significant portion of our public equity business. So I can assure you that everyone on the public equity team is highly intent on uh, making sure this trust performs over time. We've, of course, had a, an unfortunate performance drawdown recently. Um, but as I showed you earlier on the team slide, we have quite a number of professionals uh, seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, up to 12 professionals really focused on making sure this trust performs. We obviously have to demonstrate that uh, uh, in, the, in the months ahead, uh, but I can assure you that we are highly incentivized to make sure that this trust performs and outperforms the index. Uh, we do get, um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, or I should highlight, uh, we do get a lot of synergies between the private uh, venture capital investing that we do in our business and the public uh, side as well. So a lot of my venture capital colleagues, as you can imagine, do see private companies that may be on the cusp of going public. And so uh, they can share their insight on the public company, uh, on that private company before they go public uh, and help in, that helps inform our decision about whether or not to uh, participate, for example, in an IPO. So we do uh, really encourage actually a lot of exchange of ideas across all of the business lines, and that does uh, uh, help uh, performance in the public portfolios. I'm talking of the upcoming patent cliff, how can one best capitalize on that cliff and which company should benefit the most? So I think from an M&A perspective, uh, one can imagine if the patent cliff is mostly going to occur in the second half of this decade, uh, the ones uh, that are most likely to be acquired are biotech uh, companies that are going to be launching uh, products in that time frame. And so, um, you know, we've seen some, some M&A activity uh, 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 that is consistent with that. Um, we think a lot of those later stage biotech companies are probably the most ripe for, for acquisition over the next few months. Brilliant. Um, we've seen a lot of innovation in the biotech sector. Where do you see the next greatest advancements and will they be uh, a similar magnitude to the recent ones we've seen? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, just building upon what I highlighted for 2023, I think gene therapy is going to continue to be um, an interesting area for the industry, cell therapy as well, RNA-based therapies. Um, really, innovation is occurring across multiple modalities. Um, and they are generating, you know, significant clinical uh, benefit for, for, for patients. So I'm not sure if I would necessarily um, highlight one in, in, in particular. It's really innovation that's occurring across the board. Um, and um, I'm just, you know, very pleased to see how technology has improved over time to make a lot of these uh, technologies really bear fruit in terms of marketed products. Thank you. Um, there's just one on the portfolio turnover. Um, Somebody noted in the January fact sheet, I think it was 91%. Is this a function of trimming uh, or are you switching positions? And also, could you provide some color on the average holding period? Uh, so you're right. Uh, the turnover is probably averaging around 100%. Uh, and that is because we have found that keeping the portfolio really fresh uh, uh, with, with new ideas uh, uh, is uh, important to maximize performance for the trust. Um, a lot of these companies, for example, uh, they might have a significant value creating catalyst uh, at a certain point of time, uh, but then after that catalyst occurs, uh, news flow wise, it may be a little bit quiet for a while. And we found that 
as sometimes the, the, the stocks just you know don't go up anymore uh, as we're waiting for the next value inflection point for that particular security. So we might, uh, in many cases, trim that position uh, as we're waiting uh, uh, for that next catalyst and maybe get into a more timely position in another biotech company that has a value creating catalyst in the more near term. So um, that's uh, 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 you know the rationale for a lot of the turnover in the portfolio. And of course, sometimes we just get it wrong. Something fails in the clinic, uh, we just got it wrong, the drug failed, uh, and then we tend to move on from that idea and, and, and deploy that capital into something else. Have the lockdown issues been overcome in terms of the delays in the FDA, FDA pipeline? Yes, those have basically uh, been fully resolved by now. So there were some COVID-related delays in terms of approvals, as well as clinical trial commencements. Uh, in the 2021-2020 timeframe, uh, but that have all that has basically all been resolved by now. From an investor's perspective, um, has the recent period been uh, oddly volatile, or is this uh, what one should expect uh, from biotech growth trust going forward? So um, I must say that I am you know, really surprised by how far the valuations have come down. Um, you know, going back to some of those valuation slides, you can see just how anomalous this situation is. We would not have predicted that uh, given the uh, strong fundamentals of the industry. Um, and even looking at interest rates, if you look at the correlation between interest rates, uh, interest rate increases and performance of the biotech sector previously, it actually isn't that Correlated, so um, we are a little bit surprised at uh, how how much interest rates have seemingly uh, affected uh, share price performance uh, in the space. So um, I guess I would say that um, this violent uh, performance drawdown is something that I don't think is going to happen uh, very often from here on out. Um, we are going to you know obviously carefully manage the risk of the portfolio. We think we do have a well very well diversified portfolio. Um, but we do think what the volatility that you've observed over the past couple of years is probably something that uh, you shouldn't expect uh, uh, going forward as a normal course of, uh, of affairs. Thank you. Um, Alzheimer's been a focus over the last few years. What are your thoughts on the recent approval and what does the future hold as a potential blockbuster drug? Sure. So I think um, there was some controversy with the approval of the first Alzheimer's drug, Aduhelm, because um, it was approved basically on a mixed data set. What is so encouraging about this most recent approval of Lakembi is the fact that um, the data here is very, very clear cut. Uh, they had a phase three trial that met the primary endpoint showing a 27% slowing in cognitive decline for Alzheimer's patients. We think that is a clinically meaningful benefit for these patients. And as we increasingly understand how the brain works, how, how Alzheimer's uh, uh, affects the body, we think there will be more and more Alzheimer's uh, uh, treatments uh, in the offing to address this uh, highly unmet uh, medical need. So we're very, very bullish on, I think, neuroscience development and breakthroughs there uh, uh, in the future. And we do think uh, Alzheimer's is going to be a very large multi-billion dollar market. Brilliant. Just following up on your China answer, we've got a question. What is your vision of value creation in that regulatory environment? Are you saying cross-border M&A or domestic M&A, or is the China strategy to hold small biotechs until maturity? So um, there hasn't been a lot of M&A in China thus far. It's a still a fairly young industry in China. Uh, I would expect at some point some level of consolidation will occur in China as well. Uh, those Chinese drugs will be developed for both the Chinese market and in some cases for the United States market, uh, where they can command much higher prices. So um, I think it's been very encouraging to us that we now have multiple examples of U.S. big pharma companies actually in licensing innovative biotech assets out of China to market in the United States. I think that's a very telling development. We would never have seen that five years ago, um, but it does show that the uh, government um, uh, encouragement uh, of this sector and support of this sector is bearing fruit. So um, I guess TBD in terms of, you know, how we expect uh, 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 these companies to develop, but we do think that we should be able to enjoy a lot of share price appreciation in these biotech companies, even if they remain independent. 
Thank you. Um, why do you think that smaller biotech companies have an edge over the majors? And who do you hope will ultimately acquire them if they are successful? So, um, you know, I think the major companies, they do uh, engage in some level of innovation. Um, I think uh, there's some capacity constraint in some cases in terms of how many programs they can support at a given time. And I do think the most cutting edge technologies, the riskier technologies, if you will, uh, are uh, uh, more likely to be found in the smaller players. You know, some of the big pharma companies uh, can be quite conservative in the way that they allocate capital. Uh, they don't want to uh, acquire a technology necessarily or acquire a, a biotech company unless uh, that has been fairly de-risked. Uh, and once it has been de-risked, they are willing to pay up for that particular asset. Um, so I think what we've seen here in the United States is, um, frankly, um, fairly supportive uh, funding environment from the venture capital community to uh, 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 invest in some of these uh, novel technologies at a very early stage, support them through clinical trials. Uh, and a lot of those technologies are uh, uh, bearing fruit. Uh, and ultimately, it is the larger revenue generating players that are going to be the ones acquiring these uh, these nascent technologies. Thank you. Um, why is the US still the leader in innovation? So as you may know, uh, the United States uh, consumer pays the most uh, price wise for drugs in the United States. I think that has a lot to do with it. Uh, when you find that the chief end market, the largest end market for your drug is the United States, it's natural that companies in the United States are the ones that are going to be getting a lot of funding. They're going to be basing their R&D operations in the United States. This is where the reward from that R&D investment uh, uh, is going to take place. And you just unfortunately don't see that in Europe and other parts of the world. Um, where, of course, in Europe, you know, the governments are always trying to negotiate for lower drug prices. Um, so um, I think also uh, in terms of the venture capital community, I think um, we have a longstanding uh, venture capital community that has a long track record of uh, being willing to take the risk uh, to invest in biotech. Uh, we have a lot of successful exits in biotech uh, that have led them to continue uh, to put investment dollars to work in the sector. Um, and we have a number of bellwether stocks that have shown success in biotech, the Amgens of the world, Biogen, Gilead, et cetera, that show you know, that biotech can uh, really result in significant value creation. So um, I think all of all those factors uh, 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 are the reason why the U.S. remains the leader in innovation in biotech. Um, can't have a webinar without a political question. Have we really seen the end of the multi-year overhang on the sector? Can you elaborate on where the dangers lie? Is it over emerging biotech or other parts of the healthcare industry? So I can certainly guarantee that um, you know, drug pricing is not going to rear its head again politically. Um, but I'm, you know, I seem, you know, I'm fairly confident. Certainly, with a Republican-controlled uh, 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 House, rather, uh, that we shouldn't expect anything uh, for the balance of uh, the next couple of years. Uh, at the very least. Um, we'll see how things develop from here on out, but um, I, I really don't see, uh, given that they have passed drug pricing legislation, and it was difficult to pass. You know, this is something that the Democrats have wanted to pass for many, many years now. They finally got something done. Uh, I just don't see um, uh, anything incrementally worse uh, on the horizon uh, uh, for the sector. So we'll see. Um, uh, but certainly nothing uh, I would expect in the, new, in the next two years at the very least. On a macro view, how much of your valuation outlook is dependent on a Fed pivot? If interest rates are held flat for, say, two years, is that still constructive for valuations? So interestingly, if you look at this slide, look at the 10-year rate right now. It's not like we've not seen this 10-year rate before. We saw that in, you know, actually saw higher rates in 2005, 2006, but we didn't see valuations compressed to the level they are compressed right now in 2005 and 2006. So again, this is really an anomalous situation where I actually don't think the interest rate rise um, uh, really justifies the decrement in valuation that we're seeing in the space. Uh, another thing I'd like to emphasize is the fact that we are seeing right now a um, an inverted yield, yield curve, meaning that in the short term, we're expecting very high interest rates as the Fed 
combats inflation. But we do expect over the longer term that those interest rates will decline again. So if you're looking at theoretically, what is the impact of higher interest rates in your discounted cash flow uh, calculations for biotech? If you think about it, by the time you're discounting the future revenues of these companies, you should really be discounting those revenues at a much lower rate than what you're seeing today in the short term. And again, that's because of the inverted yield structure where interest rates we expect to uh, come down over time after this uh, uh, temporary episode of fighting uh, inflation. So um, uh, now that brings us to the question of, we've seen these bargain basement, unprecedented lows in the valuation. What is going to trigger the rebound? And I do think um, one could argue some sort of pivot from the Fed may be necessary uh, to trigger a rebound. I do not think, importantly, that there's more downside from here. So it's really a question of when, not if, the upside is going to occur. Now that pivot, doesn't necessarily have to be a rate decrease by the Fed. It could simply be the Fed chair saying, we're going to pause raising rates for the time being. We're going to see what the impact of the rate increases we've already implemented are on the economy. A pause, in our view, would already be uh, some sort of a pivot to the markets. And we do think risk assets would go up in that scenario. So we are hopeful that that pivot will materialize uh, this year, but we certainly do not see any more downside uh, in the sector uh, given these valuations. One supposedly interesting area of healthcare is gene therapy and personalized medicine, medicine, as you mentioned. Are there any specific biotech companies which might benefit from this trend, or can you just elaborate more on on that specific um, area? Yeah, so there are a number of gene therapies that are being uh, uh, developed. and I could turn to that uh, page on um, uh, 2023 potential catalysts. Uh, so we we own a few of these companies. Sarepta actually uh, had some news uh, last night that they are not expecting an advisory an advisory committee for their gene therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, stock is up a lot today uh, on the backs of that news. Uh, and so you know we're seeing these gene therapies uh, deliver important clinical benefits for patients. Uh, Here are just, you know, a subset of companies that are benefiting from that gene therapy trend. uh, And we do think that um, they'll be able to generate um, uh, significant sales uh, as these gene therapies make it to the market. So um, this is an emerging, interesting area. Um, Here are some companies that happen to be in that area. uh, And um, I think there are many other companies uh, earlier on in development that will also benefit. Uh, We've got a... uh... A question here, should biotech majors be sold and reinvested in favor of smaller ones as a reflection of biotech growth trust strategy? I think. So I do think a lot of the reason for the outperformance in large cap biotech is because um, people have taken sort of a defensive posture uh, given all the volatility that's gone on with the increase in interest rates. A lot of the large cap biotechs are viewed as safe places to park money. So I think actually that there's a lot of generalist investor money kind of parking their money temporarily in large cap biotech just as a place to hide. Um, I do think from a relative valuation standpoint that small cap biotech uh, is way undervalued uh, relative to historical norms versus large cap biotech. Uh, So yes, and that's, you know, consistent with the way that we position the portfolio. So we're still underweight large cap biotech still um, significantly overweight uh, 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 small cap biotech to reflect uh, you know, that valuation view. Thank you. And uh, final question, I know you're slightly limited on what you might and might not be able to say specifically, but can you talk about the 600% premium in the logic bio transaction? <laughs> so um, that was a significant uh, premium. I would add that that particular company was one of the companies trading below cash. And when your company is trading below cash, um, despite the fact that it was a 600% premium, actually relative to its historical highs, it was still well below uh, where the stock was trading historically. But it does indicate that with these beaten down valuations that companies can actually get acquired at very significant premiums. And still it's actually in aggregate, not a very large amount uh, for uh, uh, these larger companies. So, um, the size of that position in the portfolio was very small because unfortunately it had shrunk to a, a very small size, 
So I would not say that that was a major alpha generator for the portfolio. But again, I think it is indicative of the fact that larger companies are noticing uh, these bargain basement valuations and will step in with significant premiums uh, to pick up some of those assets. Brilliant. Thank you. That concludes the questions. So I'd just like to thank you, Jeff, so much for your time uh, and to everyone who's been watching this webinar. Um, if you have any further questions, please email distribution at frostro.com. Have a lovely afternoon. Great. Thank you, everyone.